Welcome to the Swindon Spring Festival. We hope all is well where you are. Now we had hoped to be presenting live events in theatres and libraries and in parks in Swindon in May, but that nasty little virus and the restrictions to try to contain it means that we can now only have a virtual festival. So welcome to this particular virtual session as part of the festival. Today's guest author has written a book called The World According to Physics. Here it is which he describes as an ode to physics, a subject he fell in love with as a teenager. It's a tremendous, sturdy and informative little 300 page book with a brilliant further reading list and is packed with questions and facts about physics. But what I personally like most about it is the way it's written in plain, bright, clear English. Terrific. Please join me in giving a Swindon Spring Festival welcome to its author, Jim Alkalili. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much, Matt. <laughs> Glad to be here. Shame I can't be with you in person, but uh, this is the next best thing. It really is a shame you can't be here in person. We were really looking forward to having you live in Swindon. And um, by the way, in Swindon, have you been to Swindon before? Yes, on many occasions, because of course, I'm sure you know Swindon, well, maybe, maybe you don't know, Sw Swindon's home to the research councils. So the government bodies that fund university research. So um, I've, over the years, I've sat on many committees where I've sort of been judging grants from other physicists in universities around the country. So I know there's that walk, sort of glasses or sort of plastic That's walkway right. from the station across the research councils. So I, I don't think I've explored the rest of Swindon, just, just the research councils, which is a bit sad. <laughs> well, we know Polaris House, which is where it is Indeed. very well. And it's... Uh, about one and a half miles from the headquarters of the Swindon Spring Festival. So the next time you come to the Research Council, um, check us out. Um, okay. I will. I will. Um, <laughs> now, now to your book, Jim, The World According to Physics. As its title suggests, though definitely keen on physics, it also asks challenging questions, quite surprising questions, in fact. For example, are we approaching the end of physics? Is the next step the theory of everything? Are physicists stuck in a rut, waiting for the next Einstein to come along? Well, he asked the questions, maybe he has the answers. Uh, over to you, Jim. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. I will, I will do my best. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased you, you, you enjoyed the book, Matt. I, I, I loved writing it. I think mainly because, you know, I, I sometimes can't understand why not everyone is in love with physics. <laughs> because for me, ever since I was a young boy, it was the subject that addresses, as you say, addresses the big questions, you know, what is the nature of the universe and our place in it, as well as, you know, sort of the more mundane, uh, you know, how things work, what things are made of and so on. Um, for me, so, so the book, I guess it's... Um, if you think of all our, so our knowledge is an, is an island, uh, and there are many books on popular science, books on physics, which are wonderfully written, huge, very often sort of thousand plus page tomes um, that cover an exploration of that island of our knowledge of, of, the, of physical reality. And beyond the island is, is the ocean of the unknown, what we have yet to understand. This book for me, I guess, is an exploration of the shoreline of the island. So it's the limits of what we know and where are we going next? What are we going to find out next? So I'm going to use a bit of technology now. I'm, I'm getting reasonably adept at um, using Zoom and screen share and hopefully everyone can see my, my slides. So uh, what I wanted to do was say something about where we are now in 2020 and how close we are to, as you say, the, the theory of everything. A theory encompasses all of, all of our understanding of the physical forces and the nature of the, the building blocks of the world, of the universe. Now, this is the title of a paper by Stephen Hawking, and it was written back in 1981. So Stephen asks the question, is the end in sight for theoretical physics? I'll just read that first paragraph. 
He says, in this article, I want to discuss the possibility that the goal of theoretical physics might be achieved in the not too distant future, say by the end of the century. So this is the end of the 20th century. By this, I mean that we might have a complete, consistent and unified theory of the physical interactions which would describe all possible observations. So he's talking here about a theory of everything, a theory that unifies all the phenomena, all the mechanisms, all the, the other theories that describe reality into one all-encompassing description. And maybe very often people talk about an equation that you could wear on your t-shirt. Everything's compactified and unified. Well, that was 1981. And here we are nearly four decades later. And now I would say we, the, the consensus now is that we are further away from that ultimate truth than we thought we were back in 1981. We've had discoveries. We've had uh, uh, major breakthroughs. For example, here are two famous ones that made uh, headlines, the discovery of the Higgs boson by the Large Hadron Collider in 2012. And there's Peter Higgs, uh, who, who came up with a theory before the particle was discovered. And then a few years later, the discovery of gravitational waves. So these are ripples through space itself. And in this case, the very first one, those ripples were caused by a cataclysmic event. Basically, the collision of two black holes out in a very distant galaxy. So far away was this event that it's taken over a billion years for those ripples to reach Earth. So imagine it's a bit like a, a giant pond and you drop a, a stone in the middle and the ripples move outwards radially and they hit the shorelines, by which time they'll have lost energy and they've decayed away. Well, we managed to pick up those faint signals of, of these colliding black holes. Both of these experimental observations were fantastic. Nobel prizes all round, inevitably. But neither of these two discoveries was a surprise. Neither was unexpected. The Higgs boson was predicted by Peter Higgs half a century ago. Gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein himself over a century ago. It was one of the predictions of his uh, general theory of relativity, which he published during the First World War. So, uh, you know, these discoveries haven't really changed our theories or changed what we thought. Now, when Stephen Hawking talked about the end of possibility the, the, of the end of physics, the end of the 20th century, he was echoing similar ideas about the possibility of the end of physics at the end of the 19th century. Around about 1890, again, physicists felt that we knew everything we needed to know about the universe and uh, that, you know, or that we had... Uh, Newton's laws of motion, his law of gravity, we had Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, we had thermodynamics, the theory of heat and energy. What else could there be about, you know, the physical world? And then at the end of the 19th century, we discover the electron. We start to learn about the structure of atoms. We discover x-rays and radioactivity. None of those things were expected at all, and of course they led to a revolution in physics, quantum theory and relativity theory and the whole of, of, of modern physics. Are we on the verge of a similar revolution now? Well, really the only big unexpected discovery in probably in my career as a physicist over the last four, four decades or so has been in 1998, and that's the discovery of what we call dark energy. Now this, I, I love this picture. This, this um, illustration was, was drawn by an artist by the name of Jeff Cummins, who, who produced the artwork for um, the, the, the Ladybird book I wrote a few years ago uh, uh, on the subject. So I love this dark energy, a mysterious force, you know, sort of stealing from, from, from Star Wars. Um, dark energy is now this substance, the energy that is stretching space apart, that's pushing the universe apart, causing it to expand more quickly than ever before. And we don't really understand what dark energy is, where it comes from. It was unexpected. 
We now also understand there are other mysteries, and something called dark matter, nothing to do with dark energy. Dark matter, probably better called invisible matter, we know is out there in space, and it's the glue that gravitationally holds galaxies together. Then there are other questions we don't know. There's some, something else related, not to be confused with dark matter, but called antimatter. We know about antimatter, we know it exists, but again, the big question is, why isn't there more of it in the universe? We believe during the Big Bang, both matter and antimatter would have been created in equal amounts. But luckily for us, there isn't much dark matter around, because if there was, it would sort of annihilate with us and we'd all go off in a, go up in a puff of smoke. So these are big questions that we realize, actually, we, not, we are not clear to, uh, close to answering yet. Um, and here's another picture from Jeff Cummins. I depict the theoretical physicists struggle uh, to try and understand what possible theory of everything uh, we might arrive at as a, an arm wrestle between superheroes. So these two superheroes, each one represents a particular candidate theory of everything. On one side you have string theory and the other you have something called loop quantum gravity. Both are uh, well, they're, 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 they're wacky. If you try and explain it in plain English, space, you know, there are 10 dimensions of space and particles are really vibrating strings. So in, in, in basic language, they're very difficult to, to explain. But mathematically, they're powerful, they are beautiful. <coughs> um, and many physicists are very excited by them. What we don't know is whether either of them is the correct description of our real world. And so while we might enjoy pretty maths, we still are a long way from being able to say, what is the theory of everything? And so maybe we have to go back to the drawing boards. You mentioned Matt in the introduction that I do ask this in the book. Um, maybe we're waiting for another Einstein to come along. And maybe we've got to go back to basics and ask the, the questions, you know, what is the nature of space? What is the nature of time? Do we really understand them? For example, uh, philosophers and scholars and scientists have for many centuries asked the question, is space real? Is it a thing? You know, if, if I have a box that's had all the air pulled, uh, emptied out of it, it's just a vacuum inside it, there's nothing but empty space. Does that space really exist? What happens if I remove the walls of the box? Does that space no longer exist? Is, was it only defined by the walls of the box? What if I put the box inside a larger empty volume and remove the walls? Does that space now exist because it's part of the larger space within the box? These are philosophical questions. And people like Isaac Newton, even going back to, to, to the um, Greek philosophers, Aristotle, argued about the nature of reality. Is space real? Or does it only exist because of the stuff, the matter that's in it? Our current understanding goes back to Einstein, and Einstein says that space and time are really fundamental and tied in with the nature of the matter and energy within the universe. Space and time can be stretched and warped by matter and energy, but it doesn't exist without matter and energy. It's not that you have space there and then you put stuff inside it. Stay, if there was no stuff in the universe, no energy, no matter, there would be no, no universe. Is that correct? Is that the right way of explaining? You know, Einstein, one of the greatest thinkers who ever lived, may not have had the complete story. In the book, I talk about the three pillars of physics, the three theories that describe the nature of the entire universe. You have the theory of the very small, called quantum mechanics, the theory that describes the nature of atoms and the particles that make up atoms. You have the theory of the cosmos, of the universe at large, that's Einstein's general theory of relativity. And then you have the theory of thermodynamics, which describes heat and motion and, and, uh, and, and stuff that happens in our everyday world. One of the fascinating things that really tells us that we are a long way from getting to the theory of everything is that we can't even agree on what time is. Now, I, mean, I know there's some wag who said, um, time is just, just way of keeping everything from happening once. 
Okay, well, that's very droll, but it tells us nothing about the nature of time. In fact, the three pillars of physics each give us a different definition of time. General relativity says time is part of the fabric of the universe. It's a dimension. Time is the fourth dimension, okay? It's, it's something that could be stretched and, and squeezed by gravity. Quantum mechanics, the theory of, of, of the microscopic world, says that time isn't a dimension, it's just a number. Time can, can go in both directions. You, you know, you, you, the equations of quantum mechanics, if you know what something is doing now, you can crank the handle and work out what it will be doing in the future. You could crank the handle the other way and work out what it was doing in the past. In fact, you could run the world forwards or backwards down at the quantum scale and it wouldn't make a difference. Time is just a number. You know, this is what the state of the universe is at this time. Then you have thermodynamics, which says, no, time's not a dimension. It's not a number. It's an arrow, always pointing from past to future, according to what we call the second law of thermodynamics. Balls roll downhill, so we get older, your kids' bedrooms get messier, not tidier, and so on. So here we have the three main theories of physics, each giving us a different definition of time. And we don't know which one is correct. And we're going to have to unify them somehow. There are other fantastic mysteries out there. I'll just very briefly, before I stop, say something about them. A popular question I often get uh, is what came before the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang happened, created all the universe. What caused it? Now, of course, if you, if you have a religious faith, you say, well, that's, that's easy. The Big Bang was caused by a supreme higher intelligence, a supernatural you know, God. But a physicist wants to e explain the mechanics of it without re recourse to, a, to, a, to a, a divine supernatural creator. It used to be that we'd, the, art, the glib answer to what came before the Big Bang was nothing, because the Big Bang was the moment of the creation of time itself. So saying what was before the Big Bang would be equivalent to saying, walk to the South Pole, and when you get there, keep heading south. Meaningless, <laughs> because once you're at the South Pole, any step you take will take you back north again. There is no further south on the surface of the Earth than the South Pole itself. But now we are starting to even question whether the Big Bang was in fact the birth of time itself. Maybe time existed long before the Big Bang of our universe. There's a, there's a, a theory called eternal inflation, which uh, suggests that our universe is just a bubble formed in a higher dimension. Uh, and there's lots of other bubble universes out there that are also forming. And so uh, it used to be thought that first you had the Big Bang and the universe expanded very quickly, it inflated, uh, and then it settled down to the expansion that we see today. Now, physicists are saying, no, maybe there's inflation, and then our Big Bang is a bubble within that inflating multiverse. It starts to get very, I love this, this is one of my favorite pictures in, in that book that Jeff um, uh, produced, me blowing bubble universes. So these questions, is string theory the correct theory of everything? Is there a multiverse with parallel universes? We don't even know how to design the experiments to test them. That's why I say we're a long way from a theory of everything. So in my book, I give a personal opinion of where I think we'd be going this century and how I think we might attempt to answer some of these questions. They're mysteries, but then, you know, mysteries are out there to be solved. And that's why I, I, I love physics so much, because there are still mysteries out there, because there are still things we don't understand. I love the fact that we don't understand everything. It gives us something to, to ponder over and think about. So, well, I, there's a short presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will, I guess, stop there because I want to give time for, for questions as well. <laughs> over to you, Matt. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, this, is, this is just what we love at a festival. Ideas, <laughs> ideas, ideas. And, um, uh, just to give you a breather, I'll, I, I was intrigued that you fell in love with physics at school and we could all tell stories about how a particular teacher had an influence on us and even our future career. And um, I didn't fall in love with the physics teacher, but I did with the English teacher. 
Uh, and I did with the biology teacher and I did with the geography teacher and they were all different genders. So it's not a, not a, not a sex thing. And um, um, so we can trace things back and obviously we have a, an inclination to go one way or the other. Um, but I've realized as I've grown older, I could just as well have fallen in love with physics as any of the other topics. Um, and what intrigues me, having gone down the route of language, and now veering more towards uh, the world of numbers and formulae a little bit. Um, something that a German poet said in the 1920s, Rainer Maria Rilke said, everything is not so utterable in words as many people would have us believe. And, and I've looked at the way scientists use numbers and formulae as a kind of more accurate way of grasping things. And yet I've kept animals most of my life. And I look at these animals and I think, they have limits to their worlds. A hen can only ask, ask hen questions. A dog can only ask hen questions. And you have a great chapter called um, Physics is Human. And I want to ask you, can we only ask questions that are limited by our humanness? In other words, we are asking questions that the ancient Greeks were not asking. Um, so we are, we think, a slightly more advanced, but we're just on some spectrum or other. But is it possible that we don't actually know what question to ask? I think, yeah, I think that's, that's that, yeah, we, we, we can only, we only see reality and see the world through our eyes and interpret it and make sense of it with our, with our human brain. So in a sense, we're always going to be limited that way. Um, I think this is where philosophy uh, is very important. Uh, philosophers, unlike scientists, are trained to try and find the right questions to ask. Mm. So if a philosopher can pose the right question, that helps physicists then go and try and find the answer. It may be that we will never, we're going to be always limited by human experience and by our, uh, you know, our, our humanity. We will never be able to reach sort of ultimate, the ultimate truth about the nature of reality. But I, I firmly believe that there is some ultimate truth that, you know, the, the world, the universe is the way it is. It operates according to, as far as we can tell, beautiful, mathematical, logical um, uh, laws and structures. And it was doing so long before there was life on Earth. Um, here we are beings that can contemplate and think and make sense. And we've learned to speak the language of nature, mathematics. Um, so we try and reach that ultimate truth, that ultimate reality. Whether we will get there, I don't know. Certainly from past experience, we've got ever closer. You know, uh, the, 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 the ancient Greeks thought everything, w w w the whole universe revolved around the earth. They didn't understand anything about the nature of gravity. Isaac Newton realizes that apples falling to the ground is due to the same force that, as the one that keeps the earth in orbit around the sun. Einstein takes it further and says, no, gravity isn't an invisible force. It's the shape, the structure of space and time themselves. So we are getting better. We're getting closer to that ultimate truth. Uh, so I think, you know, despite the limitations of, of, of humanity in the human brain, we're doing a pretty good job. But let's not be arrogant enough to, in thinking that we are approaching the very end of what we can ever know. And here's a, here's a lay person's question. And I'll probably say, oh, dear. Here we go. But um, might it be possible, you know, we look at things that are very small through microscopes and then we look at the other way and we look at things that are very distant through telescopes and so on. Um, might it be possible that we are a speck of dirt under a giant's fingernail? In other words, there is, there is a vastness beyond our comprehension. It possible, yes. But of course, that's not the realm of science that's metaphysics and, and <laughs> philosophy so science is really about you know what we can say about things that we can test and measure uh, anything that's beyond what we can put is the same as you know science can't disprove the existence of god mm. um, it, it, it's beyond what we can so it may be but as far as we can tell there, there's a structure there, there are the building blocks of the universe a galaxy on the other side of what the, of, the, of the visible universe is made up of the same stuff that mm -hmm. our galaxy is made of and so on it doesn't mean that there isn't something vaster beyond it but mm -hmm. since we can say nothing about that that sort of speculation 
while fun isn't really part of science. You're, you're a great physicist. You're, you're humble, which I think is the way to be. We say that in literature as well. Start with humility and, and then let, let others decide how far you can go. Yes. Um, <laughs> you, 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 one of your, your many tasks is to try to popularise science and physics, uh, which is quite a task because it seems a very strange human way of behaving that we like to almost pigeonhole ourselves. We like to say, I am a something, and we describe ourselves. Mm. And what that seems to stop us doing is being open to other ways of interpreting things. And the question I want to ask you is, why are so many people suspicious of science? I think people are afraid of what they don't understand, what they don't see. Very often people are put off science, particularly subjects like physics or mathematics, um, because they, they, they probably feel that it's beyond their ability to, to get to grips with those concepts. I don't think it is. You know, I, I, when people, I hate the term dumbing down when people talk about science communication. Oh, this is complicated. You have to dumb it down so that people can understand it. As though somehow the non-scientist is less intelligent than you or less smart than you. It's, it's flattering when people say, oh, Jim, you're a professor of quantum physics. You must be so brainy. No, I'm good at quantum physics because I spent my life thinking about it. Well, but I can't play football like David Beckham. I can't play a concert piano. I can't write tr great literature or poetry. So, you know, th this is a skill that I found I was, I was good at, I enjoyed, and that I've honed and practiced over the years. So I think people are suspicious of science because they feel somehow that they would never be able to comprehend it. And a, my job as a science communicator is to explain that actually... I can get across some of the basic ideas, certainly get across the, the thrill that I feel. That's what I've tried to do in the book, why I find it fascinating. I don't expect to be able to put in simple words the whole explanation of quantum mechanics or relativity theory. It's not, it's not easy, it's hard. It takes a long time to get your head around it. And that's to get that across. It's not that I'm so brilliant that, that, that I can understand it so easily, it's because I've invested the time and effort to try and understand it and anyone could if they really felt that you know enough of a passion okay maybe brains are wired in slightly different ways you know I, you will have a certain talent for mathematics or for music or for literature or whatever but there's a lot you can do by by practicing and learning and the job of science communication and a book like this is to somehow short circuit that and say well if you just want a taste you just want a glimpse of why i find it exciting here's why. There's plenty more you could do if you want to take it further. And um, <clears throat> I found that at the festival, um, people, we, one of our slogans is life is for learning at the Swindon Festival of Literature. And it's a kind of hidden agenda because if we put that at the top, people might resist it. But if people come and have pleasure and they learn something, those two things, they go away very happy. And so do I. And for example, this book, I got pleasure from it because it's so, I don't want to, I've got no reason to flatter you at all, but it's, it's, it's so brightly and plainly written. Uh, and it only has about eight or nine graphs. Um, and, uh, and it has lovely similes and metaphors. For example, the one where you describe the galaxy, the galaxies are like um, raisins in a loaf and that the loaf expands, but the raisins don't. And mm. that's so crystal clear. And it strikes me that a lot of subjects could be taught with that degree of clarity without one having to know the algebraic formulae that, that led you to that piece of information. Don't you think? Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, I think the reason why I and, and, and other science communicators do what we do is I think because we, firstly, we derive a genuine pleasure from explaining a concept to someone and having you know the light bulb go go on over their heads and say, ah i see yes oh that's fine i genuinely feel a thrill in explaining something to someone as much as i do discovering it for myself and i always said if i discover something new about the world or something amazing or some it's a wonderful fact why would i not want to tell everyone who <laughs> who would listen all about it so yeah. i think Yes, you know, there's, a, there's a reason why we do it, but also I, 
I think it's partly because, you know, I'm, I'm able to put myself in, in the other person's shoes. Not all, I think not all scientists are able to empathize in that way. They, they, you know, they have to catch themselves. Well, no, if I, if I use that concept or that idea, this person I'm talking to won't know what I'm talking about because they don't have the benefit of, of my, my understanding. So finding the right language appropriate to what you feel the person you're explaining to uh, uh, can understand, I think is very important in science, science communication. It's not just about getting rid of the jargon, you know, people are, or making things very simple. It doesn't have to be simple. Mm. It just has to be using the appropriate tools in language that can, can trigger an understanding in someone who doesn't have the mathematical specialism. And it's definitely possible. Um, it is. Yeah. My, my last two questions, I'd like to roll into one. Um, there's a section in your book uh, where you speak of um, where physics, chemistry, and biology come together. Where do they meet? And I was very keen on biology, but not keen on physics. So this is really a personal question. I want to know how biology will help me to get closer to physics. But also it occurs to me that that question that you address in your book um, might also link to my final question. So maybe you can do the two together. And that is what part can or does physics play in the present uh, pandemic that we're facing worldwide? Well, to address the first question, um... Certainly you learn about these different subjects, physics, chemistry, biology, in these silos, separate subjects at school. You would even study them maybe as separate subjects at university, and some people would be better at one rather than the other. But there are many areas of, of exciting new research today that bring them all in together, interdisciplinary areas of research. So to give you an example, things like genetic engineering or, or, or nanotechnology or artificial intelligence and robotics, all of those subjects, which are, you know, are driving uh, 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 technology in the 21st century, need expertise from physics, from chemistry, from, from biology. My own current research interest is in an area called quantum biology. So it's the idea that down, you know, at the level inside um, living cells, there are mechanisms that seem to only be explainable by appealing to the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, and so it requires physicists and computational chemists and molecular biologists to work together. So at my university at Surrey, that's exactly what we have. We have a large center where we're all having to learn each other's language, having to understand the way each of us sees the world differently. So there's a lot of opportunity for, for, for um, uh, bringing these subjects together, uh, uh, certainly in, in the 21st century. When it comes to something like the current, the pandemic and understanding the coronavirus, again, there are areas which bring expertise together from lots of different disciplines. Trying to understand the nature of this virus, trying to understand how these mutations take place, how it was then able to transfer from animals across to humans, mapping its genome, trying to develop uh, vaccines, this requires not just genetics or, or virology, um, it requires chemistry, um, computational chemistry and biochemistry. And it also even requires understanding of physics as well. And then uh, trying to understand the spread of the virus. It, it, this, that's the job of epidemiology, this, the spread of, of, of disease. But developing mathematical models, statistical models, which we still almost groping in the dark trying to understand some of the mathematical uh, issues here, again, requires computer scientists, artificial intelligence experts, and indeed physicists. So very often, the most exciting uh, and most important areas of research do require lots of different specialisms to come in and, and look at the, the problem from different angles. And I hope physicists will have, will, will, will play a role. They're, they're not, I don't think physicists are arrogant enough to think that, you know, step out of the way, le leave the job to the physicists. We are the smartest of the bunch. <laughs> I'd like to think that everyone can bring something to, to okay. you know, to the, to, the, to the problem to help, to help tackle it. Brilliant. Um, Jim, thank you very much. Um, Jim, Jim not only asks lots of questions in this book, um, but he answers lots of them. It's a really nice style of writing. He raises a question and then he addresses it. And in these times of being forced to stay at home, um, get the book 
and you can't go to your local bookshop and get it alas but you can get it online so it's still available online the world according to physics by jim al khalili um thanks if you've been watching uh, join us for other virtual events at the festival but most of all please join me now in giving a swindon spring festival thank you to jim al khalili jim thank you very much my pleasure glad glad to be yeah. with you in spirit indeed <laughs> thank you Thank you for uh, watching this virtual session at the Swindon Spring Festival of Literature and the Arts 2020. We do hope you enjoyed it. And we also hope that you will join us for the rest of this virtual festival. Here for you are details of the author you have just watched, their book and our online information. Thank you very much for joining us and keep well till we meet again. Mm -hmm.